Tonight uh, is going to look a little bit different, and we're going to be oh, going to Genesis chapter 1. If you have a Bible, I invite you uh, to go there. And as you're turning there, um, a couple of years ago, I was, I was jogging and I was running on the treadmill in Dallas at Lifetime Fitness. And, uh, and, and at Lifetime Fitness, it's kind of like Buffalo Wild Wings. So there's like 20 different screens that are up that you can just watch. Uh, and I'm ADHD, so uh, really nice for me, especially when I'm trying to keep my mind off of, you know, my lungs collapsing because I'm not a runner in any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so I'm trying to run these couple miles and, and I see this, this, uh, this one screen where uh, it's just like this heartwarming moment where this, um, this father is throwing his son in the air and it's like this slow motion shot and the son just has this like big laugh and like he, the dad's smiling as he's about to catch his son. And then, and I looked over at the next str- uh, screen and right beside that was, uh, was actually a news story that was covering a shooting. And, and so, and it just struck me because I, I, was, I was going, man, like, this, this beautiful moment's right next to this broken moment. And I started to watch uh, over and over again, the screens just one after another. I was, it was like this beautiful thing next to this broken thing. It was beauty and brokenness and beauty and brokenness and beauty and brokenness. And, and I, I think that all of us, we, we wonder and we have that question. It doesn't matter where you're at spiritually or on that spectrum with what you believe about God um, or, or what you don't believe about God. Every single person on the planet, I believe we all have this deep question where we go, why? Why Why so much beauty, but also it's so marred and there's so much brokenness and destruction and, and we see it all around us, right? Like we see it in the division among people and the abuse and the, the situations that people come out of and the depression that some people carry um, just from some of the things that happen to them. And just there's, it's all around us, the sins that we struggle with in this room. We see this beauty and brokenness and we go, okay, why? Where is that from? And it goes back to the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter one, in the Garden of Eden, God, um, it begins with, with God saying and speaking the world into existence, just like we just saying that, that God creates and creation is speaking something about the goodness of God. In the original design, God creates the atmosphere and it's good and he creates the land and it's good and he creates the sea and it's good. Over and over again, it keeps on saying this line, and God saw that it was good. He creates the trees and the vegetation, it says it was good. God's like the ocean. G. Bob Ross, just happy accents everywhere. Um, but he, over and over again, you see six times in, in this, this Genesis poem, in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew poem that, that he says it's good. But then he gets to um, humanity. And at the last thing that he creates is actually Adam and Eve, he creates us. And I want to read that together in Genesis chapter one, the pinnacle of his creation was actually us. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have domain over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God, he creates us. And it says that this, these key words, he creates us in his image. Nothing else, no other creation was created in the image of God. And, and again, just asking the question, why? It's because of this, because we were uniquely created by God to be known by him and to experience his love in a way that no other creation can, that we were to, to, to know him and love him and be known by him and loved by him. Like this is, this is where we get our purpose. This is where humanity gets meaning. This is the purpose and meaning of life and why he created us, to join in his love. So I can illustrate it this way. So um, I have a seven-year-old. So uh, just under eight years ago, um, we decided, you know, my, my wife and Carrie and I, we decided that, uh, you know, we want to try to have a, a child. And and we had that conversation, and if someone was to ask us, why did you decide, decide that you wanted to have a child? We wouldn't have said, oh, it's because we needed some void filled in our life. Actually, there was strong love that was between us. I would have actually said, from the love that existed between Carrie and myself, we wanted to create another person to be able to join into that family of love so they could join this, this relationship, so they could join and be loved by us. And God, when he created us, I think it's something like that. 
that out of the love that existed between God and himself, so we believe that God is Father, Son, Spirit, so God, love exists between two parties, or or in this case, the Trinity existing um, eternally, uh, and and God out of the love that exists within himself, because scripture tells us that God is love, and so God created us so we could join in that. That's why God created you and me, and we got to, we, we were created to rather spend that kind of relationship with all eternity, spend all eternity in that kind of bliss, that kind of life. It, it's kind of that, that, that sheer delight of the, the father throwing the son in the air kind of captures that. In Garden of Eden, which is mentioned um, in verse eight, that this garden was called Eden. It actually means delight. That's what Eden means. That we were created to just live in the goodness of God. And then God, he, he takes them, puts them in the garden in, in this just pure bliss. And then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, we see where God, he puts this tree in the garden and says, hey, don't eat of this tree um, or you're going to die. It's showing that there is a possibility to go away from God. But I'll read that um, together in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. It says this, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so we know what we're about to read, uh, at least many of us do, that they actually do take of this tree. And that's why the world breaks. And that's why we have all the issues we do today. That's why there's beauty and it's marred and it's also broken. And we're about to read that. And a lot of people are going to go, okay, here's my question. Why did God put the tree in the garden to begin with? Like, why did he give the possibility for us to go away from him with, if there is so much um, darkness and brokenness and sin and whatever you might want to, what word you want to attach to it, we see it all around us. Why would God put the tree in the garden? And here's why. Because God wanted a love relationship with us and true love requires choice. You can write that down. That's a true statement, true love. And there's not a, 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 an instance that you can tell me, I do not believe tonight, where true love does not require choice. True love, it requires choice. And God wants us to choose to follow him. And that's why God, he gave this possibility because he wanted them to have the choice to choose him or not. And uh, Tyler, a uh, guy that spoke here um, a couple weeks ago, he uh, posted this and And I'll share what he said. I agree with it. He said, I'm convinced beyond a doubt of this, that God wants to be loved. He wants to be a priority to someone. How could we have missed this from cover to cover, from beginning to end? The cry of God's heart is, why won't you choose me? It is amazing to me how humble, how vulnerable God is on this point. He says, you will find me says the Lord, when you seek me with all your heart. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. God desires a love relationship with you. He is drawing us tonight, the point of tonight, God drawing us into his love and out of our sin so we can experience what we were supposed to experience in the beginning. We can start to experience that again, because man, I've started, I've started to. I've experienced God's love in my life and I believe that all of us can. But God, he created the world in perfect rhythm in sync and in harmony. But then, but then the world, it, it broke whenever sin entered, when they chose to eat of the tree, which we're about to read what happens after that. And everything was no longer in sync and in harmony. Um, uh, my, my wife, she brought me this CD, just a simple illustration. Um, she brought me this Britney Spears CD, um, hashtag free Britney. Um, but but she, she, she if, uh, I, this is just the one that she chose. Um, but if I was to take a pocket knife or I was to take the CD, uh, right now the CD would play right. It would be in rhythm. You would be able to listen to the tracks the way that they were meant to be played. But if I was to take this and I was to scrape it across the concrete or take a pocket knife and scrape it across the CD, it would no longer play right. Why? Because now it has been marred. Now it has been marked in such a way that it will never play right again. It will skip and it will skip and it will skip. And this is what happened with God and him creating us and creating the world with his design. We chose to sin and that sin put a massive mark where it's now marred and it skips and it doesn't play right. And where it was once in um, harmonious rhythm and now it is broken. And that's what happens whenever they eat of the fruit. 
And after they eat, we're going to pick this up in chapter 3 where, they, where it's called the fall. In chapter 3, starting in verse 7, they eat of the fruit that God told them not to eat of. It says, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. This is where shame enters into the world. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and this is where people started to be afraid of God. And maybe you came in here tonight going, man, I just haven't come because now I feel like me and God are not on a place where he wants anything to do with me. And this is what Adam thought. And he said, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Man, we've been hiding ever since, and there's been so many places in my life where there was a period of time that I would not have found myself in a room like this because I knew what I was choosing to do um, with my weeks and my weekends, and I knew that I was choosing to go away from and stray away from what God wanted for my life, and I just thought, man, I've got to hide this from the Lord. I can't come to him with all of this. I've got to shove that down deep inside and just kind of act like everything's okay when I do have to go to a place like this and talk about Jesus, and people are talking about God to me, and I just, man, I hit it and I think, man, we've been hiding ever since and we're good at it. Um, a f- couple years ago, uh, my daughter, she uh, wanted to get a diary. And so uh, my wife and I, I think it was like at a garage sale or something, we got her this diary and it was like her secret diary, right? So um, she's like five and a half. So, uh, so obviously as parents, we we can definitely see her diary whenever we want because, you know, she's five. Um, and, and so, but she gets this and, and it has like this little lock on it, if I can remember right. And so she thinks that it's like going to be just locked and safe. Um, but, she, but because she's five, um, she's not very good at hiding things from us. And so uh, she had gotten it. And the first thing that she had written, um, she, she had it completely just wide open on her, uh, on the couch. And then Carrie saw what she had written. And I just want y'all to see what she wrote. This is what she had put in her diary. Uh, I like the way dog poo smells. Oh, I can't wait to show that to her boyfriend when she's 16. See, like, the reason why I share that, though, is because she, she would think, like, oh, mom and dad won't see this. I'm going to keep this to ourselves. Some things you shouldn't write down, by the way. Um, but, but mom and dad won't see this, and it's like, it's like man, we, we saw it, baby. We saw it. It's an it's a open diary. And, and when it comes to us and God, God, our Father in heaven, he, he, what he's trying to tell you and I tonight is like, listen, I see what you want to hide. He didn't ask Adam, hey, where are you? Because he had no idea. He asked Adam, where are you? Because he wanted Adam to come out of hiding. Because he wanted to have this interaction with Adam. God knew. And God sees the things that we want to hide. He does. And the truth for you and for me and the invitation this evening is simply this, that we can come out of hiding from wherever we've been. We can come brokenhearted and we can let rescue begin tonight. This is what God wants to do in your life. This is what he wants to do in my life. This might be God's moment talking to you right now where he's saying, where are you? Where are you? Saying, would you you come out of hiding tonight? Would you come and realize that God saw it anyway? And he's still here and he still loves you and he's not done. And we're going to see this tonight, I think in a powerful way, but they hide from God and we've been hiding ever since. And then in chapter three, verse 16, whenever um, they chose to eat, everything breaks. And so we see to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. And so pain starts to enter this world in pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. And so she's saying, listen, uh, what he, God's telling her rather is listen, like now there's going to be conflict. We just did a sermon on this a couple days ago. The reason why there's so much conflict between us in our relationship relationships, not only in marital relationships or dating relationships, but all of our relationships. The reason why there's conflict is because of the fall, because everything broke when sin entered the world. Harmony between God was broke and harmony between each other was broke. And ever since we've been experiencing this. And so we have broken homes and abuse and things like that that happen. I've been through both of them. Part of my story Verse 17 
says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. The earth is broken and fractured now. Now there's going to be viruses that spread. Now there's going to be all kinds of things that happen, natural disasters. These aren't things that happen because God wants them to happen. They happen because we chose to go away from God. When you go away from the author of life and you disobey the author of life, it, to disobey God and to run from God is to embrace death and destruction. That's the teaching of scripture. And man, it's true. It's true. And then we see in verse 19 where death enters. It says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Death enters the world. Brokenness enters the world. It's not only outside of us, though. We see this all around us, don't we? But we also got to be honest and say, we actually see this in us. And so there was a um, theologian named G.K. Chesterton. And um, back in the day, he was a popular theologian, and he actually... uh, a very popular magazine or, or newspaper, can't remember which one, they asked him if they would answer this massive question. They said, would you write in response and answer this question, what is wrong with the world? And so they, they posed this just crazy big question to him and wanted him to write a response to it. And there's been full books written on this, right? And his response to that question, what is wrong with the world, was actually one sentence. He sent back one sentence and what he said was, dear sirs, To answer this question, what's wrong with the world? He said, dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. What he was acknowledging is that, listen, the brokenness in this world is actually because of me. Because I know what's in me. I know that, and, and, and if we're in here, we're gonna have a really honest moment just between us and God. I think that all of us know that there's something not right within us, that there's something that, that man, that we, we understand that something is broken, something needs fixing within us. And I think that all of us get this at our core. And it's because, it's because of sin and it's because of the, the brokenness we were born into. And G.K. Chesterton, he recognized this. But God didn't leave us there. That's, what, that's why we're here to worship is because God didn't leave us in Genesis 3. God, God has a plan for us and tucked away even into the middle of Genesis 3. We see in verse 15, it, this is called the, the Proto-Evangelion, which is called the first gospel. This there is a prophecy about the coming Messiah in, hidden and tucked away in the middle of the fall. And it's in verse 15 where God is speaking to the serpent who is the, the, the satanic figure here. Um, the devil he's speaking to and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And then it says, and he will bruise your head. Or, it's, or the uh, NIV says, he will crush your head, but you shall bruise his heel. And that the crushing of the head, that when Jesus comes, he is going to ultimately crush death, sin, and Satan and all of his power by rising from the grave. And that's where we're going to end tonight. But man, it's going to cost the cross and it's going to cost the poison that Jesus is going to soak up for you and for me so we can get the forgiveness that we could never get on our own. And man, so Jesus, what we are going to see is Jesus steps into our mess to save us. And man, we praise him for that. So the the Garden of Eden is where we broke the world, Adam and Eve sinned. But we're about to go into the Garden of Gethsemane, which is where Jesus chose to be broken so he could save the world. And we're gonna be in uh, Luke chapter 22. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there. Luke chapter 22. Um. We're about to read about how he's on this Mount of Olives or, or um, like in Matthew 26, it, it calls it the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane literally means oil press. And there's a, there's a point even in the place that Jesus is at in the moment that we're about to read because olives were crushed. They were crushed to produce their most valuable resource, oil. And we're going to see that Jesus was crushed so he could produce his most valuable thing for us, which is salvation. He was crushed to save you and to save me. And we pick it up in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 39. It says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples 
follow him, or the Garden of Gethsemane. And he went and he came to the place. And when he had came to the, came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. We'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 41, and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And man, this is the moment that Jesus, that right here, this is our eternities are hanging in the balance in this moment right here that, that he says that not my will, Father, but yours done. It was the Father's will that he would crush God the Son, that, that Jesus would, would do this for us. Why? Because God loves you and he loves me, man. Like it's so crazy that this is what God would do. I remember hearing about a, a cross message from Louis Giglio at a, a conference called Passion Conference years back where he was speaking in Houston and he just, he just gave this simple picture of just saying, like, imagine this stadium that you're in right now was lifted up and all of your sin and guilt and shame was placed in that. And then it all just like a laser beam, every weight of the stadium and all of your guilt and shame just fell and crashed and crushed into one person. Imagine what that would be like. That's what Jesus did for us. And he was talking about this and man, it was just clicking for me. And I was, uh, I was already saved, already knew Jesus, but I was just in awe of the fact that God would be crushed to save someone like me because he loved me and that was the father's will to crush the son not my will but yours be done and then in verse 45 and 46 rather sorry verse um, 43 we'll pick it up it says and there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And this word agony is really interesting. It's the Greek word agonia. And it means, to, it means to fight for victory or to struggle for victory. So he's actually warring over our souls right here in this moment. He is going to war. The war is decided right here and right now. He's about to go to the cross, but he's decided that we were worth it in this moment, that he saw all the sin, all the brokenness of just my life. And he said, man, Travis is worth it. And he's saying the same thing about you tonight, that he looks at all of the brokenness that you have done and all the brokenness that has been within your mind and your heart. And he says that she is worth it. He is worth it. I will still go to the cross. As he's in agony, going to war, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat becomes like drops of blood falling to the ground. And then it says, when he rose from prayer, he had asked his disciples to pray in his most um, just horrific moment, in his most um, just intense moment, so much that he's sweating drops of blood. And he's saying, in my most desperate moment, would you just pray? Would you stay and pray with me? And they couldn't do it. And they fell in this moment, even as he's about to go to the cross. It says, when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. And man, the, I actually think that this is such an amazing thing as I read this when I think about myself, because here's the truth that we see here. Jesus meets their failure with his faithfulness. That in their moment of failure, as he's about to go to the cross, he's still going to meet it with, their, with his faithfulness. And Jesus meets our failure with his faithfulness. This, this Jesus in the garden meeting our failure from Genesis 3 on, and he's meeting it with his faithfulness as he chooses to still love us and still go to the cross. And as I was around the table studying this with a group of people, um, we, we talked about how, man, it's crazy how God still loves me. Like, when I think about that, it's it's it causes awe in my life. And we started to just write one-liners about how God has loved me through it all. And one of the guys, Tucker Thompson, our young adults intern, he said, I chose the world over him. I left Jesus for sex and porn and alcohol and drugs and rejected him and his plan for my life, even after I had come to know him. And he still loved me. Another one of the guys, John said, I had the world in the palm of my hand and I found no satisfaction. And God still loved me through that. Daniel said, I struggle with anger and he still loves me. Another guy said, I struggled to, with identity and chose to look to the world for success and he still loves me. That was Christian, our intern here. 
Another guy, Justin Bloss, he said, where I made the same mistakes over and over and over. Have you been there, man? We feel like, God, are, how could you still be here whenever I keep on messing up? And he, and he end, ends it by going, and he still, he still loves me. Another one said, I was addicted to porn and chased after girls. I believed that I was unworthy of love. I believed that this world was better off without me, self-hate. I was suicidal and self-harmed. I was depressed and alone, and Jesus loved me through that. That, that Jesus met his self-hate with sacrificial love. And no matter what it, kind of baggage you have on the inside of you tonight, that Jesus wants to meet you with his sacrificial love tonight. It's a simple, life-changing, eternity-changing message tonight. Another guy said, where I fail to view myself as loved and value the gift that my life is. God is, was, and will always be faithful to remind me that I am a beloved child of God so much that, so that he gave up everything for me so that I could be free to walk with him. So I could be free to walk in his loving presence daily. <clears throat> Trevor said this, he said, I ran from God and gave myself away before marriage and Jesus still loved me. Another guy said, I chose popularity and pleasing others, caring about their perception of me than at, more than actually following Jesus, but he still loved me. And then I wrote down, I told God, I hate you out loud. And he still loved me, man. And I don't know if you find yourself in this list, and I don't know what your one-liner would be. I don't know what maybe your one-liners would be. I don't know if it would be a massive list just that you could write out just for you. But what I'm telling you is that he meets that failure with his faithfulness. And that is the good news of Jesus. Even right now, that I want you to hear this, that man, he still loves you. There's a quote by Pastor Ben Stewart that I think is amazing. He said, don't dishonor Jesus by pretending that your sin is more powerful than his sacrifice. And your sin is not more powerful than a sacrifice. And this was all decided in the Garden of Gethsemane, the oil press. And then we see how he was crushed, that Jesus suffered so we could be saved. And we see in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 63, Jesus is arrested. He's betrayed by a kiss from Judas. And it says, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. And so they beat him. They slammed the crown of thorns on his head. And in other places in scripture, it says that they spit on him and they just start to mock him and beat him and make fun of him over and over again. And he continues to go through this. Why? Because he's carried by his massive love for you and for me. And so he's mocked and he's beaten. And then chapter 23, verse nine through 11, he's questioned by Herod. He's sent to Herod and it says, so he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. Jesus did not respond. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him, then arraying him in splendid clothing to mock him even more and make fun of him. He sent him back to Pilate. But he's there and he makes no response. This is very, very different, very, very weird. You would expect in a trial that somebody's going to make the plea for their innocence, but he did not want to plea for our innocence because he was paying for our sins. That's why. That's why he stayed silent because he chose to pay for our sins instead of plea his own innocence. And so he stays silent as he's going to the cross so he can pay for you and for me and our salvation. And then in chapter 23, verse 20. It says, Pilate addressed them as he's seeking to release Jesus once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I found in him no guilt deserving death. He's innocent. Innocence traded for my guilt. I will therefore punish 
and release him. And whenever he says punish, we see in other places what that meant. What he ordered was that he would be flogged. And this is where he took the cat of nine tails that was, um, had leather straps. And each one of them on the end of that strap would have had sharp rocks, nails, or glass. And then these soldiers, these, these men who did this for a living, um, they would take in 39 times. What they would do is they would take it and they would slam it across the back of someone. It would wrap around it. And then they would rip it backwards, um, exposing the person's flesh and, and bone and all that stuff. And, and that's what they would do is an extremely, extremely painful thing to go through. And many times people died from that alone. And so they're beating the back of Jesus and it's all because he loved me. It's all because he's soaking that in because the truth of the matter is, is man, it's not just these Roman guards who were whipping Jesus. It was, it was really me, man. It was really my sin. So in that sense, we are the Roman guards. He's doing it for us all the times that I went away from God and chose my way instead of his. For the times that I said, I don't want anything to do with you because I'd rather experience the pleasure of this world than going out and sleeping with who I want to, drinking what I want, smoking what I want. And he still loved me. He's innocent, and he took my guilt. Verse 32 through 34, we see the moment of the cross. It says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, or maybe your version says Golgotha, this hill of Golgotha, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said in the moment as he, and when someone was crucified, they would have been probably seven or eight feet off the ground. And so everyone would have been just below eye level with him, looking at him and, and they were making fun of him and mocking him in this as well. And he's dying on the cross. And as people are driving the nails through his wrists, what does he say? Father, forgive them. That's crazy. Why would he do that? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. So that way, whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but they would have everlasting life. It's the greatness and the massive love with which God loved you and loves you and loved me. Man, this is an amazing thing. And so how do, how do we respond to this truth that he would die on the hill of Golgotha? We're about to sing a song lyric. It says Jesus, that, that's gonna uh, echo this truth that Jesus created the very hill as the God that we started with, the one that spoke everything into creation. He knew that he was creating the very hill that one day he would die on. So what does God's grace cross and salvation mean for you and for me? It means that, man, when God sees me, he doesn't see failure, he sees a cross. Man, when, whenever God sees you, he doesn't see the mistake. He, he, Jesus is saying, I don't see that. I see the crown of thorns that was placed on my head to pay for that. I don't see the guilt. I don't see the guilt that some of y'all are carrying around. I don't see that anymore. If you have a relationship with Jesus, he says, I see the cross where I said, Father, forgive him. Father, forgive her. He says, I don't see the brokenness that you carried in your soul. I see the back where I was whipped. So as I became the darkness of sin to pay for you, then to take that darkness from you, I don't see you with condemnation. What he sees is where he was condemned in my place. He says, I don't see your sin. I see where I became your sin so you can be set free. Galatians 5, 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Man, this is good stuff. This is powerful stuff. This is life-changing stuff. That he saw it all. He saw it all, all of all of the sin, and he says they're still worth it. Last semester, I talked with a guy, um, and uh, he was struggling with everything from the abuse that he went through to his um, addictions that he was stuck in to um, questions about his sexuality and all kinds of stuff. And he, he said, man, I, I just don't know what I think about God at all. And I get kind of frustrated and I've just got a lot of things going on. And I said, well, man, what, what do you think's drawing you here? Like, why do you, you keep returning? What, what is it that's causing you to still come to the worship gatherings you go to? And, and he said, man, I can't help but think, what if this God actually loves me? as I hear about Jesus. I can't think, what if this is actually real as I've wrestled with this stuff? Like, what if this is a true thing that Jesus is real? And I think, man, this could be true and he could love me. And then uh, months went by and earlier this semester, he sent me this message and said, I'm not sure, but I think I may have been saved last week. And then just a few days later, he sent me another text and said, hey man, I just thought I would tell you that I'm three days sober from weed and alcohol and I've never felt better. 
And then he said, Jesus is real and good and saves and it's true. He said, I gave away all my bongs, pipes, paraphernalia, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been so aware of Jesus's presence and love. And man, as I read that text, I just celebrated because at the cross, Jesus took every mistake, sin, addiction, and brokenness by becoming sin for us. Man, he loves you. And this is the love that changed my life. That's why I stand here today talking about it, because it's real. And it's the love that can change yours. This is what he accomplished in the Garden of Gethsemane. Where, where things broke, where everything fell. And then, and then we, we talked about the Garden of Gethsemane where he chose to go to the cross for us, where the war was decided. And we saw, and we just read about how he went and was crucified in our place. And we're gonna end tonight by looking at the Garden of the Resurrection. But man, this is a game changer that Jesus rose from the grave. This is the linchpin of the Christian faith. If Jesus did in fact rise from the grave, man, everything has changed. In Matthew chapter 28, verse six, the angel speaks and says, he is not here for, this is the game changing statement that changed all eternity right here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. The pastor at this church, uh, Pastor Steve, he said this, and it stuck with me. He said, the stone was not rolled away so Jesus could get out. No, the stone was rolled away so we could see in. And man, everything has changed from that moment on. But I want us to see this garden idea show up again as we celebrate the garden of the resurrection and what that means for our own resurrection, starting in uh, John chapter 19. In John chapter 19, in verse 41, it says, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. Man, we're coming full circle. There's a story that God has told from the beginning of the Bible to this point. And we're seeing this idea that it's the story of redemption and our own salvation and our own resurrection. And so there's this garden uh, that, that's, that he's crucified and buried in. And it says, in the garden, there it goes again, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, there they laid they laid Jesus there. And then skip down to chapter 20, verse 11. It says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb because she didn't realize that Jesus had risen from the grave. And she wept as she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. She didn't recognize him in his resurrected state. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And here it goes again, supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani or Rabbani, which means teacher. And I love that it's whenever he calls her by her name, when he says, Mary, that that's when she recognizes him. That's when she recognizes who, recognizes who it is because it's, it's a love relationship. It is a connection with you that God wants. And it's in this relationship that she recognizes who is actually speaking to her. And I believe that it's not only her name that he's calling, but it's your name and it's my name. And man, the, this idea of the garden, it's telling the story of redemption and resurrection. And with his res resurrection came ours. And so it's in the garden is where humanity was broken. But it's also where Jesus offers us wholeness by defeating sin and death on our behalf. It's in the garden where the chains of sin were placed on you and on me, but it's in the garden of resurrection where Jesus made a way where there was no way, way for us to get to God. We could never do anything to get to God ourselves. So he came down to show us a way. It's in the garden where our relationship with God was fractured. The garden is also where our relationship was stored. The garden is where shame entered and the garden of um, the resurrection is where Jesus redeems us. It's in the garden where decay enters, but it's also in the garden where Jesus makes us new. It's in the garden where Satan won the battle but it's in the garden where Jesus won the war forever and ever and ever and offers to restore you and to restore me. It's in the garden where we fell, but it's in the garden where Jesus rose forevermore. It's in the garden where sin and death entered, but it's in the garden where life, man, life gets the final word. Jesus wants to give you life, give me life. With his resurrection came mine. 
I was talking with a student um, two years ago on Easter. She uh, had tried to commit suicide. And I, I got word of this, and me and Danielle, our college women's director, and on Easter evening, we found ourselves in a hospital room talking to this girl who tried to take her life. And as we talked to her, we talked to her about a lot of things and what, what was so um, going on in her, so much so that she chose to, to just try to remove herself from this world. And, and as she was in the hospital bed and I was talking with her, I, I, I said, I just don't want it to be. And this is, man, so powerful. This moment was powerful for me personally, but I believe it was powerful in the room because I don't want us to lose the, I, this fact that this is Easter. I was talking to her on Easter evening and I said, listen, you know what Easter is, right? I said, Easter is a day of death that God turned into a day of life. And I believe that this is what God wants to do in your life. And this is not only for her, but that's for all of us. He takes the death that should be ours and turns it into life because of what he has accomplished for us. Man, and this is why we celebrate him. He gives resurrection where there was death and decay. He raises us from our addiction, from our mistake, from the shame, the guilt, and the spiritual death that was ours. And he gives us new life. It's this simple yet life transforming message. And man, I just want us to celebrate the love that came down to set us free. Can we celebrate that tonight? That God is amazing. He's good. He changes lives. Let's continue to worship him some more.